Hi, I'm Tyra G, your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual global gathering of phenomenal listeners. Yeah, you. Fearsome and generous, humble and honest, in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. Every week we meet here for an hour to experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other through our joy and lessons learned. We share topics that tradition tells us there are some things we just don't talk about, but not at this table. Here we live beyond the wreckage and the judgment. Every week, we start right where we are. You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the Internet at www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, should you miss us, no worries. You can catch our podcast on YouTube. Just key in, frankly speaking, with Tyra G. Yeah, and if you feel like connecting with me, I'm loving the emails. Keep them coming. It's Tyra at TyraGarlington.com. Thanks so much, so much for tuning in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our Frankly Speaking theme song. And naming it, I'm listening. It's March, National Women's History Month when we intentionally recognize the ongoing great contributions women have made to our nation. Frankly speaking, what Tyra G is celebrating this month with a twist. We are looking at phenomenal women and how we embrace and manage our universal experiences, our rainbows and clouds, our courage and resolve. You know we're a journey, right? Not a destination. A process, not an event. Even when we are still, we are motion. Loving, serving, nurturing, encouraging, and empowering. We are love. And love does. But sometimes, sometimes we get stuck. Between our no longer, the familiar, the habits, and our not yet who we were created to be. Now we may ask the question, am I enough? By the way, the right answer is a resounding yes. Our theme song this month is you're more, you're more than who you've become. Our common thought space this month is offered by three authors who have walked authentically, strategically, and vulnerably, author Wendy Pope records the following words in her 2018 book entitled, Yes, No, and Maybe. And she calls out the question, and I quote, What if this is as good as it gets? Maybe life has worn you down. You attend church, even midweek Bible study. On Sundays when you aren't greeting visitors, you're rocking babies in the nursery. Or you're rushing back and forth between services to sing in the choir. The other six days are no less hectic. The laundry pile is endless. The family insists on eating dinner every night. Homework is hard. School projects are complicated. You feel like an unpaid Uber driver in overdrive. Or maybe debt is what keeps you up at night. Student loans loom. Jobs in your field of study aren't available. Working two two part-time jobs to make ends meet. As you stare at your shrinking bank account. Or maybe you feel like your life is on track. 
but you long for companionship. However, the dating site has not found your perfect match as you open yet another invitation to a wedding you evaluate your life whether we are stay-at-home moms or go-getting career women devoted wives or single gals we've all had those moments when we've been weighted down by the uns of life these uns filter into our lives no matter where we are or what we're doing unmet expectations unfilled unfulfilled dreams unanswered prayers unwanted situations well i have great news you and i were created for more than mundane motions this is not as good as it gets Author Marianne Williamson, the author of A Year of Miracles, explains the daily practices that keep our minds and ourselves open. There's a force in the universe that literally weighs things down. In order to counter gravity in the physical body, we physically exercise to develop strong muscles. Emotionally and spiritually, things work the same way. We nullify the effects of emotional gravity through accumulated repetitions of positive thoughts. Where the world says, when the world says things like, this can never happen. Well, we repeat to ourselves that with God, all things are possible. Without deep peace of mind, we cannot be the people we're capable of being. And we cannot live the lives we're capable of living. Brene Brown in her book, I Thought It Was Just Me, suggests we spend too much time and energy managing perceptions and creating carefully edited versions of ourselves to show the world. There's a constant barrage of social expectations that teach us that by being imperfect is synonymous with being inadequate. No, no. Everywhere we turn, these these messages tell us who, what, why, how we're supposed to be. So, we learn to hide our struggles and protect ourselves from shame, judgment, criticism, and blame by seeking safety in pretending and perfection. Brene believes that our imperfections are what connects us to one another and our humanity. Our vulnerabilities are not our weaknesses. They are powerful reminders to keep our hearts and our minds open to the reality. Guess what? We are all in this together. I love the strength that emerges when we speak from a place of authenticity and vulnerability with one another. You know we're not alone, ever. After the break, you'll meet another phenomenal woman who has challenged herself to be more than she's become and, as a result of her journey, is poised and committed to help others who may be at a point of transition as well. You guys stay close now. Hi, I'm Brett Michaels for the American Diabetes Association. Diabetes is a constant battle, testing, treating, fighting to live a normal life. I know, I've had diabetes since I was six years old. A lot of people don't think it's deadly, but diabetes kills more Americans each year than breast cancer and AIDS combined. It's been called a silent epidemic, and without your help, it will keep getting worse. Please join me in the movement to stop diabetes. Share your passion and your story. Get involved in local events like the Tour de Cure or the Step Out Walk. Learn how you can better manage this disease or reduce your odds of developing it. And give what you can to help us spread the word and fund programs like the Diabetes Camps for Kids and research to find a cure. Join the movement at StopDiabetes.com. Help us fight a deadly disease that shortens and burdens the lives of millions of Americans. Together, we can stop diabetes. And we are back. Yes, my guest today is an 
interesting book in the human library. I'm going to let Anne Duffy tell her, tell you in her own words, who she has chosen to be. Now, I have gotten to know just a teeny, teeny, teeny bit about her. And choice has a lot to do with what drives her life. Uh, she lives just like the authors we've heard about, authentically, strategically, vulnerably, with ongoing goals of self-compassion, self-awareness, and self-improvement. Miss Ann, welcome to Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Thank you, Tyra. Thank you for having me. Well, here's a quick synopsis of who I am. Okay. So my my personal mantra is that I am a powerful, intimate, accepting, and worthy woman. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's taken me a long time to say that without yeah. tears or without saying it and knowing that it's true. Let's put it that way. That is important because we can all do the script, but you obviously have internalized it. It, it was a journey, right? It was totally a journey and it's been about um it's been almost nine years actually that I first developed that that statement in some personal growth work that I did but let me just tell you a quick uh give you some quick background on myself so I work with my clients to find what they love and love what they find hmm. so that means that in their careers in their lives in their relationships um, but most importantly, to love what they find within themselves. And so I'm a leadership coach, and that means that I have powerful conversations with my clients mm -hmm. that have an action commitment at the end of each session. Okay. So that they are accountable and that they, are keep, they continue to move forward towards their own goals and dreams. How I do that is just by listening very closely to what they're saying. And I do a lot of work, coaching work on the phone. And, you know, Tyra, you'd be surprised what you can hear. I'm sure you know, being a radio host, you can hear a lot just by the human voice. You yes. Don't, need, don't always need to see the person. And so that's my job, to be lovingly curious with my clients and try and learn more about where do they want to go based on what they say they want to be and do. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I am also a coach, a triathlon coach. And I work with beginner and intermediate triathletes, and that means swim, bike, run. That's a sport, an endurance sport. And I also work with beginner swimmers. And it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding to work with someone who was – previously afraid of being in the water and yes. to see them swim across a pool lane for the first time and uh -huh. to cheer them on it's it's amazing let me let me ask a question i had been used to hearing the term triathlon but always associated with men have women or maybe traditionally they've always been there but i've not heard it is it historically both male and female equally involved in the sport? So historically, not so much. Okay. So the sport of triathlon started in H Hawaii on the Big Island in about 19, oh gosh, about 78, I think. Okay. It's been around about 40 years. Uh -huh. And no, it was primarily men started out, much like the ru like running. Right? Okay, yes. Similar to the Boston Marathon, right? right? Women ran it, but they entered maybe under a, under someone else's name who was a man or you know they had literally people chasing them on the course to say you can't run this women can't <laughs> run this <laughs> what um so yeah so the 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 sport of triathlon women's membership has grown um exponentially particularly in the past five years in, okay at the beginner level okay all right i interrupted you as usual um yes so yeah so well the, so that in addition to being a leadership coach that's the other piece of my business that I also love and enjoy. And, you know, the most interesting part about that is that a lot of it is the same, the same thing. And by that I mean, are you setting short and long-term goals? 
Oh, okay. Uh huh. Are you showing up both mentally and physically for your day, for your practice, whatever that looks like? Mm-hmm. Um, do you forgive yourself even if you have a bad day or a bad practice? Okay. Okay. Um, and what does the finish line look like? Does the finish line look like I just want to walk across and have a smile? Does it have other specific goals attached to it? Those are all attributes that can be used both in my leadership coaching, that are used in my leadership coaching business, as well as my triathlon side of coaching. Okay, well, let's let's get personal. All right. What's been your experience as a, com- a competitor? Uh, as with everything, it's a journey. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so... This is going to be my seventh year mm-hmm. starting, uh, my, my seventh year in the sport of triathlon. Okay. I came from a running background. Okay. I began, I began um, as a runner. And, you know, I started in triathlon just because I wanted to check it off a list. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to just say, you know, wow, that's something that I did and now I can go back to running. And what ended up happening was after I completed my first triathlon and then my second and third, I thought, gosh, there's something to this. You used the verb completed. You didn't say, did I win? Did I place? Did I show? What happened? Oh, my gosh, I did. I didn't. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, well, it was a journey. I, after my first triathlon, I very vividly remember there were some gals who also crossed the finish line, and they said, congratulations, you got a medal. This is your first triathlon. This means you're a triathlete. And I said, <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. And I was very graceful about the whole thing, you see. But in my head, I said, no, not yet. Well, okay, all right. We, we may come back to that. You had other people celebrating you. You had a medal, and you, inside of you, you hadn't reached the goal that was inside of you, right? So that's exactly. why you're saying that? Exactly. I, I, because for me, I was already tuned, and this was in 2013, so this was several years ago, and I was already tuned into the idea that it's all a process. Okay. And so when I completed that process of, you know, becoming I could swim but becoming a better more proficient swimmer and a better cyclist and a better runner Mm -hmm. I just thought well yeah but it's not done yet there's still more to come and so I I really I almost felt like I was a runner masquerading as a triathlete so that's interesting (laughs) that's interesting and what's what's going on in my head as I'm listening to your story is how often externally someone evaluates our performance and we're saying, but that's not my best. That's not who I'm going to be. Yeah, 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 I got you. Okay, I'm on your wavelength. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and there was a certain, even a few years ago, there was a certain level of, um, I was still struggling with the, the, the unworthiness, the unworthiness issue in my my life and I had worked through it for the most part but there was still more work to do at that point and Mm -hmm. so I also that was I think a little bit a part of it you know that these wonderful women around me were celebrating and they said yes high five this is great you did an awesome job and again I was graceful on the outside but on the inside I was like not quite Mm -hmm. not there was yes there's still work to do and I thought "Mm, I don't know there's some it wasn't um I wasn't fulfilled yet. Okay. Okay. So um, how did you go from that space to coaching other wannabes, other people in their process? Did they just, did you advertise? Say, hey, I can help you. How did, how did that work? Oh, my gosh. That's such a good question, Tyra. You know, it was, it was totally organic. I, okay. Okay. I, I went through, I don't know if other people have this experience, but I, I went through my own process of, of personal growth, both within myself and in the sport. 
Okay. And there was such a parallel there. And so in about 20, I think it was 2015, no, it was 2016. 2016, I, I, I thought, you know, I have a background in education and, and teaching young, young children. And I thought, hmm, I, I'm, I'm never going to be Michael Phelps in the water. I'm never going to be <laughs> good. A tour, <laughs> yeah, I know, a Tour de France racer. You know, I'm never going to be, a, you know, a marathon runner or a speedy Gonzalez, right? But I can teach it. Okay. And I love the sport and I can teach it. And, and I think there, I thought, yeah, I think there's something here. And I thought of myself as a fourth grader. And I thought, I'm a fourth grader. I could teach a kindergartner. There you go. Right? Uh-huh. I can, I can teach, I can teach a, a kindergartner. And I thought, okay, maybe there's something here for me. And so I investigated, what's it going to take to become a triathlon coach? Mm-hmm. And did a little research, filled out the application, made it to the made it into the class and got to a place where got to a place where gosh I I could do this I, I so I I took the class and I said wow this is really possible and so that's really what started my that's what started my journey um, of being a triathlon coach um, in fact I was I became a triathlon coach before I became uh, finished my leadership studies work as well so there's really something to that. They were both parallel journeys. Well, it seems to me, now you know I have a, I've been a teacher and a principal, and what you said was so significant, maybe I can teach this, to be able to, to translate and transfer a gift to someone, and they, you see it replicated, and you know that learning has occurred, to me was one of the greatest gifts I received in that role. And I can imagine, you know, somebody that's scared of the water, all of a sudden you see them going across the pool, you're like, wow, I was a part of that. Yes, that's the best part, to be able to say, I was part of that. Yeah, I um, have a question. Okay, with what you've just told me, I want you to dream where are you in two years in this whole scenario? Mm, such a good question. So I'm just, I'm just closing my eyes for a moment and sort of thinking about that question. In two years, I am, mm, I have a thriving leadership coaching business. Okay. And I have clients whom I, I should say more clients whom I love. Uh I love my current clients and more have come to me. And I also am giving workshops. I'm, I'm teaching and I'm giving workshops to um, both private folks who are interested in getting toward their goals in a more deliberate, intentional way, as well as even in the corporate space. And on top of all of that, I also can, will continue to be triathlon coaching. Okay. All right. Because that's, I, I just, I love them both. They're sort of wrapped up in this really cool, like, multicolored cotton candy ball of You're in the middle. No. Yes. Yes. When I think of the process of becoming, I always think of my heroes and sheroes that I put in front of me and said, ah, I like that. I like what he does. I like what she does. Do you have, well, of course you do. Who are, (laughs) who are your heroes or Mm. sheroes, either in the leadership world, in the life skill world, or in the becoming world? Who do you read? Who do you, you say, oh, man, I got to catch that show, or I want to go to that speech. Do you have someone, some ones like that in your life? Mm. I have to say, off the top of my head, one of my heroes is my own coach, actually. Okay. Yeah. So she, and I, you know, Tyra, I'm even like getting teary-eyed as I think about it, because she is, I wasn't expecting this. She is amazing. 
vulnerability is one of the strongest things we can offer. Um, I need to uh, let you know that you're amazing, too, just as you are. And I I know people that listen to the show or listen to the videos after hear me say that. Guys, guess what? No matter where you are in life at any given moment, you're amazing because you made it to that minute. You survived and you overachieved and you're here and you're sharing you. What's so special about this coach of yours? She's amazing. What does that mean? Well, you know, I'll tell you what, Tyra, the first thing that came to my mind is she's a surfer. Oh. Can you imagine? So she's been coaching me for about maybe two, two and a half years. Okay. And she's also a mentor, right? So she's been coaching for, I don't even know how long, at least 10 years, probably more. Mm -hmm. But um, so our conversations over time have morphed from... uh, in the beginning, it really was her coaching me, mm-hmm. right, on any given topic that I needed to work through. Um, and lately, what I've noticed in the past mm, two to three months is that as I've grown exponentially most recently, our conversations have become different. So mm-hmm. I'm asking her things about, well, what would you do about this? And, and what do you think about that? And so there, there's more back and forth, mm-hmm. right? Whereas um, usually, and, and, you know, again, there's no wrong answer. And, and there there will be times when I need her to be my fully coach. And she's been a mentor, and she's really just been able to, because she's gone through so much in her own life, she also is an athlete, and she has been a teacher. She's taught in different places around the world, and mm-hmm. and she lo- obviously loves the water in in a different way, right, by mm-hmm. surfing instead, as opposed to swimming through it, right? Um and, you know, she's a strong person, too. Um, she. What do you mean by that? Mm. We use that word a lot. And, and one of the things I try to do on the show is walk behind the words that we use, the language. I'm, I'm a language bigot. <laughs> I love language. I love its yes. power, its repairing power, that kind of thing. So, um. When you say strong, what does that mean to you? Mm. She holds the space for me when I need it. Okay. And she pushes back against me when I need it, too. Like she'll challenge some ideas I have either about myself Mm -hmm. or about a situation and a certain perspective I may be holding on it. Okay. Um, that that for me is what what strength means because she's she's capable. If you could see me, if your listeners could see me right now, I'm I'm holding my arms out in a sort of T outside of my body, and she holds this big space when we're having our coaching conversations for me, so that I have the ability, freedom to explore an idea or a situation or a dilemma that I'm having. It sounds like you feel safe with her. That there's trust. Absolutely. Yeah. There's absolutely trust. And and for my listeners, I'm I'm wiggling around in this space. Um Anne has talked about mentor. She's used the term mentor. She's used the term coach. Uh, we're we're gonna do something that I've never done on the show yet. Uh, but because Miss Anne is a coach and uh I wanted to have her show you what that means, how that gets translated. So I offered to be a guinea pig. Miss Tyra is going to be a guinea pig. So uh, I am going to approach Anne as a coach. And let me tell you, let me tell you what my expectations are. That's the first thing. Um, and thank you. I am so glad you agreed to work with me. I have, um, I, I call the season of life I'm in the end of the toilet paper roll. Things happen really fast when you get to be my age and you've done a lot. So I have sat with myself and said, now what? And, um, 
ironically, I hadn't planned on having a radio show. Ironically, I had not planned on taking screenwriting and writing a children's animated show. Well, I have these things, but I I can't monetize them, haven't figured out how to do that. And they bring me such joy, but I keep thinking I need to be more responsible. I need to be more like I was in the corporate world, you know, pounding the pavement, making money. But sometimes I'm just tired. I I need to talk to somebody about this, and um, I think you just might be the person to help me. Although I don't know where to start. I don't know the proper, I don't know. Help me. (laughs) Okay. Well, so Tyra, the good news is you've already started. First, I always like to ask clients when I'm in a situation like this where there's not always a previous coaching relationship, do I have your permission to coach you? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So my sense is there's two juicy pieces here, right? So Mm -hmm. there's the, I I should do this, I should do this, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the other piece of the passion and the love. Which feels more resonant to you? Um, again, now this could this could be a consequence of age, but I'm almost getting angry when I hear the should. Oh, let's go there. Can we go there then? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about the what's the angry? Um, okay. When I started my life, my professional life, there were not a lot of options. Now, I came from four generations of teachers, so I went from Ohio State into the classroom, okay? And love that, love children, joy, joy, until I found out there were things I couldn't help the kids with. So I went on to graduate school to become a psychologist, and, you know, how do I do this? And then I was on a clinical staff, and I was in the midst of crises all the time, and I had a boss who told me something about me. He said, You have a gift. You can see beyond the presenting problem, but here's the issue. You have to learn how to pace so that you can allow your clients to get there in their time, not your time. And then he said, the other thing is, you're too involved. You don't know how to have professional distance, and you're going to burn out. And I did. Let me stop you there for a second. So for the purpose, for the for the sake of the coaching, mm-hmm. what's the nugget in there that's important about the anger and the should? What's the connection? It was, it was like you have gifts. You think this is a good place to unwrap them, but you can't make it work. And the person that's telling you, in order to make it work, you should do this, this, and this. And the this, this, and this isn't who I am. Um, I couldn't, I guess I wasn't right for that. Because after 18 months, I did burn out. And I have not gotten, I've not gone back to a clinical situation, not even tried to go back. Because, you know, I progressed to other places. But, um... Yeah, that was it. And when I I went from there, can you imagine unconditional positive regard, behavioral psychologist walks into the doors of IBM, and all of a sudden I I see a quota board where everybody's performance is out there for the world to see. And even when you do great, they say, what have you done for me lately? So here I was. It was kind of... I don't know if I have the language for this, but this was my journey. I would go places, I would be successful, but there was always something else I needed to do to stay to stay successful. I needed to grow. I needed to I needed to conform. I needed to be more like the infrastructure that existed around me. So, when I hear when I hear I need to or I should, that's a flag for me as a coach that means 
let me give you a little bit of background. That means there's this, what we call a saboteur, mm-hmm. right? A mm-hmm. saboteur that is, you should do this, or right? There's some little thing that's niggling at you that's making you agitated. And now for the vulnerability, all my life being an African-American female, during those times, I had only certain channels that I could swim in. And apparently, I have abilities that wanted to take me out of those channels, okay? So I grew up with tapes in my head that said, you have to be twice as good as the next person. You have to work twice as hard. And I never really asked why. Why, Mom? Why, Daddy? Why? Why? Now, they told me, you know, the obvious reason. But but why? Why is the world that way? Why can't I be who I am? Why must I fit into slots? So that the anger probably started way back there because um, I have friends that became pharmacists and went to medical school, you know, and I don't know. I don't have an answer. So part of... Part of how how the, the type of coaching that I do, right? There's a difference in coaching between that and, and therapy, right? Yes, and yes, I know yes. I, you're fully familiar, but for our listeners, just to share a quick um, quick background, therapy does look backwards, right? And it's helpful and useful, and there are a lot of people who benefit from it. And coaching looks at where are you now in this moment and going forward. Correct. So. What is this? What does the should feel like now? Like, tell me, where do you feel it in your body? To be totally honest with you, it's intermittent, and I realize it's situational. Okay, when I am here in the studio, when I am writing, when I am vlogging, when I, should it doesn't bother me at all. When I think, oh, you know what? Mm. I should start really marketing inspirational speaking. I should, that's the should. Okay. When I'm giving something of myself that I want to create, that I believe from the innermost part of my spirit will help someone else, I'm full of joy. When I think, okay, now you got to put this into a format. You got to market it. You got to do this, that, and the other. So now it's putting a structure around what I what I want to give out, which is pure and different. And it makes me tired. It makes me angry. Maybe I'm getting to it. Maybe the should is when I feel alone. Maybe, maybe. I need a team. Maybe I need staff. Maybe I need help. Because sometimes I get tired when I think, all right, in order to do this, in order to bring this to market, you need to do this, 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 and this. And I look at the list. I'm good at creating the list. I know how to do that. But at this point in my life, I'm just like, I don't feel like doing it. That's where I get angry. That's where the shoulds. That's where I go work out or go to sleep or read a book. You know, I just like, okay, well, you can have that. So uh, maybe it's because I'm at the end of the toilet paper roll. Maybe I don't feel like I have to. Or maybe I don't feel like I should have to at this point in my life. Well, you know as well as I do that everything is a choice. Yeah. Right? And I, for the sake of our coaching... With the with the saboteur and with these shoulds, when we get to the end of our conversation, our coaching conversation, what do you want to walk away with? What's going to have you say, yeah, that was good? You know what I think I want most is for you to understand where I am, what I'm trying to do. I've learned that... The answers are within me. 
I've learned every time I have a question, that answer is within me. I just need someone sometimes to help me navigate to get to it, okay? So my goal in communicating with a coach would be for them to understand where I am so we can walk together the next step. So if at the end of, say, uh, the next 10 minutes, I want you to say, no, I want to feel like, I think she got it. You know, I stumbled. I had permission to stumble through. Uh, I had permission to look back but not stare. I had permission to realize that a lot of what I'm feeling right now is because of things I had to work out and, and some residue that's still there. And I'm not lying about it. I'm not wearing a mask about it, but it's still a part of who I am. So, um, yeah, I want you to uh, identify with some of the issues. I'm not looking for sympathy, empathy maybe, okay? So that's mm -hmm. what I probably would like. Okay. So the type of, just to give you, to share with you and, and our listeners, the type of coaching that I do, it's very inquiry-based. Okay. So I affectionately refer to myself as a professional listener. Okay. Doesn't mean that it's unguided listening, right? Earlier I asked you about what's the nugget in here? What's the connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, if you're comfortable with it, I want to go back to like the, the should. Like because mm -hmm. when you go, it's almost like one of your values is, right, being very heart-centered. Yes. Right? Absolutely. And that's what fills your cup. Yes. We know what our values are when we, yes. when we feel that. Yes. And then somebody comes along and they take a fisherman's net and put it over you. And you're like, I got to do this and I got to do what to get known? So my question for you is, now that you've noticed when those come up, we talk about saboteurs. What does the voice say to you? I think if I answer that truthfully I'm at a place in my life when the shoulds come creeping up in the voice I go into a choice mode do do, do I want to do that um, who's that really going to benefit um, do I have to do it can I do something else so in many ways I'm excited that the voice is not directing my behavior, but I'm still processing the fact that it's still there. Now, maybe it's been over the years and, and the scar tissue and all the things I've had to do to survive that are saying, look, you know what? You're amazing. You don't have to do that. You don't need to do that. But at the same time, I'm saying that and I'm living accordingly there may be a little bit, a little, on one of my shoulders going, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear, can we, can we build that voice out even though it's small? Tyra, you are strong and you are very self-aware and you're so wise. Oh, listen to that. Y'all hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's part of what I do as a coach is that I see my clients for yeah. who they truly are. Yeah. And, and and champion them. Thank you. You're welcome. And and I want to build out that little voice because only by listening to more of what it has to say can we know what it is. I've got something came to me, okay? Uh, my cohort, my friends, people I know uh, have are continually working for someone else or for themselves, the revenue's coming in, and, and they're fine. Uh, me, where I am, the fixed income, I can't jump on the plane or jump on the ship like I used to. And so that little voice might be, well, if you did this, you could do those things. And the conflict is, how important are those things to me? If I'm liking where I am, does that make any sense? It absolutely, yeah. And so, what 
I'm realizing as I'm talking to you, I'm using other people I love as standard bearers, as as uh, a measurement. And like I go out with my girlfriends, the girls. I love them. They love me. They treat me financially, you know. And it's hard for me to receive it. And they know that, you know. So uh, I try and do other things that with them, for them, that doesn't cost money. But I sit there sometimes and think, you know, Tyra used to be able to pick up the whole check. And now they're saying, Ty, we got this. Come on. We just, we just want to love up on you. Just don't even worry about it. That bothers me. That's part of what could you do to, I don't, I don't know. I, are y'all listening to this, this, this conversation we're having? Because um, it's not role play as we started out. It's real. And um, I'm giving you a piece of me that hmm, I wouldn't have sat down and say, hey, y'all, listen up. <laughs> Here's some things going on with me I want to share. But we're here now, so I'm not going to run away from it. But I think we're getting to maybe the, the right word isn't should. Maybe there's another word I should s- use instead of should. Uh, and I don't know what that is. I don't have that. So I also want to challenge you a little bit on the receiving piece. Yeah. Because you know as well as I do when we receive and then we can give, right? Mm -hmm. So I just want to challenge you on the receiving part too. And this is one of the things I do with my clients is I I make a request of them. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, and you are allowed to say yes, no, or counter offer, by the way. Okay. Because with this is a, a equal relationship here. Okay. Tyra, yeah. the next time you're out with your friends uh-huh. and they offer to treat you for dinner, mm-hmm. will you graciously say thank you and simply be grateful? I'm practicing that. It's hard. And you know why it's hard? I'm a giver. I'm a nurturer, and I've been able to treat people on vacations, and all, and I can't do it anymore. And perhaps this is God's way of saying, you know, this is a lesson you really need to learn. It's still, I'm awkward. How's that? But I will say yes. Awesome. And just to wrap this up, the last thing I ask is, how will I know and by when? Oh, Okay. I can tell you what I've done. I um, could not do, you know, take the four of us out for dinner. So what I did was I sent a message out that said, uh, it was a love message, a little cartoon, and said, you know, uh, y'all have been just the girls. We've, we've been good together, and I appreciate it. And I'd like to have you at my place uh, for dessert and drinks, and a love fest, and that's what I did, and they wrote back, oh, yeah, we're on, and here's what they did, though, shoot, we'll just, we'll do potluck, and I didn't want that, I wanted it to be for me, but I resisted, I didn't say that would be good, I said, I got this, just come, and let's do this, I did not say, thank you, you can do this. I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. I found a way around it. So I'm not there yet. I'm a process. Mm-hmm. I'm a journey. Yeah. I and, do need and, it. And that's, and coming, you know, as we wrap this coaching session up, that's where we are in this moment. That's why I asked you, that's why I made a request for you, a request for action, right? Will yes. you agree to do this, to receive the goodness that they are giving to you? Yes. Yes. Um, The other thing I have to admit is the way my life has been, I have not positioned myself to receive. And what I have learned is as long as I was giving, people couldn't really see me because all the energy was coming from me and they couldn't see what I needed 
And sometimes I just really needed them to sit with me, to hug me, not to say anything. Now I've gotten to the point where I'll phone up and go, hey, and I'm okay just having a conversation, connection that I needed at the moment. Um, I'm working on the other. So what I hear you saying is there's vulnerability in letting yourself receive. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's for most of us humans, right? How often do we brush off support? No, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. You know what we're going to do? Uh, the reality of coaching is not it isn't a 20-minute session on a radio show, <laughs> unrehearsed true. or whatever. <laughs> so what we're going to do is do it again. Is that a deal? That's a deal. I would love that. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do now is um, something I love to do. <sighs> Leave us with a spiritual doggy bag. Let me say I love it when women get together courageous enough to look and walk behind the words, giving each other permission to expose their gifts and imperfections. Frankly speaking, is our time and space to help, to heal, to educate, and encourage one another. Ah, into the best version of ourselves. In the process, we will redefine traditional perceptions about winning, about beauty, about making our mark and making a difference. I want to leave you with a message from love, also known as God. In the words of Glenda Doyle Melton, stop holding your breath. Breathe. There's enough. I've created an abundance of acceptance, attention, recognition, joy, peace, money, energy, clothes, food. I will never leave you without enough. And there's nothing to be afraid of. No feeling, no circumstance, no person. These things come and go, and you can live through them without running, hiding, numbing, or hurting one another. And did you know this, my angel? There's never been anything wrong with you. Not one day in your life. You are exactly who you were meant to be right now as you are. You are not to be ashamed. You punish yourself, but you have no reason to be punished. You can stop now. You are free. When you were born, I put a piece of me in you. Like an indestructible, brilliant diamond, I placed a part of me inside of you. It's love. Love is perfect, and it is untouchable. No one can take it. It is the deepest, purest part of you. That part that someday will return to me. You, you, you are love. You cannot be tarnished by anything you've done or has been done to you. Everyone carries this piece of me. And I'm that part of you. The essence of each of you is love. You've been listening to Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. My guest today has been Miss Ann Duffy. If you listen to the show, you know she'll be back. She'll be back. Remember this. I'm here. I'm listening. You're worthy. And you're never alone. Your seat at the table is guaranteed. This is Tyra G. I love you.